Hi, everyone. My name is E. David Crawford. I'm a professor of urology at the University of California, San Diego. Androgen deprivation therapy, clearly the foundation and the backbone of treatment for many cases of locally advanced and metastatic prostate cancer. It is one of the most effective and well-tolerated therapies for any advanced cancer. The goal of ADT is pretty simple, lower testosterone, lowest possible level, and keep it there. In the past few years, we have learned a lot about the challenges facing the physician administering and the patient receiving ADT. These include escapes and testosterone rises from a number of different causes, lack of clear understanding of what is the definition of castrate and dealing with the many side effects, which go way beyond hot flashes, include things such as osteoporosis, weight gain, sexual side effects, and more recently, the understanding of cardiovascular events. Joining me to discuss these many topics are two international leaders in prostate cancer and GU cancers, Dr. Ben Lowentritt and Dr. Neil Shore. Ben serves as a medical director of the Comprehensive Prostate Cancer Program and Director of Minimally Invasive Surgery and Robotics at Chesapeake Urology, which is a member of the United Urology Group Practices. He also serves as Vice Chairman of the Physician Services and Director of Prostate Cancer Services for United Urology. Dr. Lowentritt is a member of United's Executive Leadership. He's been president and director of many societies um, in his home state and also section. We're really glad to have Ben with us. Also, Neil Shore, um, who is medical director for the Carolina Urologic Research Center, and he practices with the Atlantic Urology Clinics. Dr. Shore uh, is in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He graduated from Duke and uh, Duke Medical School. Still a Duke fan, I don't know why. He completed his general surgery urology residency at Cornell, New York Hospital, and a fellowship at Memorial Sloan Clive Kettering. Dr. Shore is uh, the chief medical officer for surgery urology for a large group called Genesis Care. He, he serves as the chair of uh, the educational committee for LUGPA. I just had the opportunity to attend the LUGPA meeting in Chicago, and it was just an outstanding presentation. He also reviews for many uh, editorial boards, reviews in urology, urology times, and so forth. Dr. Shore and his colleague, uh, Alicia Morgans and Chuck Ryan, published a review paper several years ago entitled Resetting the Bar of Castration Resistance, Understanding Androgen Dynamics and Therapy Resistance and Treatment Choice for Prostate Cancer. This publication is going to serve as sort of the core of our presentation today, and I'm glad that we have the author here, Dr. Shore. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the my slide presentation. So our program tonight is entitled ADT as Foundational Therapy and the Need for Consensus on Consistent T Suppression Goals, Monitoring and Delaying the Time to CRPC. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. We, uh, as urologists all know that the that the prostate, the, the testosterone is dependent on an intact hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. And there's lots of different ways that we can interrupt this axis. And when we do, uh, the, the, the testosterone that is that we measure in the eugonadal men is about 95% from the testes. That changes and we see some contributions from the adrenal, the tumor and other things which uh, we want to uh, try to neutralize when we treat prostate cancer. Hormone therapy, uh, there are a lot of different flavors out there and options. Estrogens are one of the first bilateral workiectomy, as you know, goes way back to the Huggins and Hodges era. Uh, the, really, the, the changing point was the introduction of LHRH agonist and a little bit later antagonist. We also have uh, usually oral drugs, oral antiandrogens, and we can call them first, second, and third generation. 
That's what I do. Combine androgen block A, putting things together. And, and now we're into doublet and triplet therapy for newly diagnosed disease. And 1720 lyase inhibitors, which are um, androgen biosynthesis inhibitors uh, that are out there available. So this is Dr. Shore's article, uh, an excellent article. And uh, I've got it right here in front of me. And uh, we'll go through it here for the next few uh, next few minutes. The one of the things that uh, that we know from history is that when we first started doing studies with uh, T lowering with ADT and bilateral orchiectomy, our methods to measure testosterone were not uh, down to zero, but but basically uh, less than uh, 50. And that's that sort of remains now. But we know from studies that were done more recently in the early 90s and mid 90s and 2000 is that when you do a bilateral orchiectomy, what you see is the T levels down less than 20. And now we can measure with male spec down much lower. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that. Dr. Vogelsang, who uh, passed away a couple of months ago, a very good friend of ours, was one of the pioneers in looking at testosterone levels in prostate cancer. And in 2012, a number of us got together uh, in Bethesda, and we came up with this Bethesda con uh, consensus and basically said, hey, we think that less than 50 isn't uh, where we want to be. We want to be less than 20 or lower. And then other organizations went along the EAU and Canadian Urological. Um, the AUA and NCCN have not committed totally, but one step in the right direction was a couple of years ago, the FDA says, well, because all these studies were done earlier when we can only measure less than 50, is it really right to say less than 20? That creates some conflicts and issues and things like that. I think that could be overcome. But anyway, now they say in less than 20 is a good secondary endpoint in clinical trials. And, and we'll talk about Dr. Shore's trial that was published uh, in New England Journal of Medicine here in a second or two. So I've uh, said a lot here. Let me just uh, talk to our panelists here. If we have this uh, we have this uh, hypothetical um, question that we ask in an ARS in a medical meeting with urologists. Uh, ben, how do you think urologists in general would answer this question? No, I think if we're answering it in a crowd, we would always answer three. You know, the, the should be is less than 20. I think we have a general acceptance that that's important. Practically, I think a lot of people still accept less than 50 in their practice. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, I think the evidence, as we'll discuss, and as what you're discussing, is is pretty clear on the value of less than than 20 being both an accurate depiction of what compared to castration, which is you know really what the terminology means. But you know, fundamentally, we're talking about what's most effective to combating the cancer, and I think that's um, where we just have to be intellectually honest with what we're trying to achieve when we're treating with these drugs. Neil. Thank you, David, for inviting me and um, for all the amazing work that you've done and the great work I've been able to do with you over the years and educating our, our colleagues on, you know, what is the value proposition for androgen deprivation therapy? Uh, does, does it matter how low the testosterone gets? You know, you, you've been pioneering on uh, most, if not all, of the the um, T suppressing uh, drug um, formulations. And as as everyone knows, the the regulatory approval it's a pharmacologic endpoint of just getting below fifty. And I and I think, as that earlier slide you showed, it, it's it's a little antiquated because the uh, ability to detect. Uh, Serum T, uh, the assays have really changed significantly over the years. But you know that said, um, we still have this very um, conventional historic definition uh, that the FDA uses. I think an interesting other question to this is what the target. I I'm still uh, surprised how often our colleagues don't check a baseline testosterone 
before initiating androgen deprivation therapy, and even after initiating, initiating androgen deprivation therapy, they just check the PSA and if the PSA goes down to a level or declines to a level that they're comfortable with, then then, they're, then they feel that the androgen deprivation therapy that they've selected is effective. Uh, I, I personally think it's very important to check a baseline testosterone before I start a, a T suppression therapy. And I think it's important to check it soon afterwards so I know how effective it is. And, and, and yes, I agree that we should, if we, if we believe in the importance of starting ADT, which is a which is a seminal moment for most men, unless it's a very short-term therapy. So why wouldn't you want to know what your baseline testosterone is? Why wouldn't you want to know how effective your androgen deprivation therapy selection is? And, and yet I don't think that's practiced uh, by the majority of our colleagues. Neil, let me ask you this. Should we be working together to make a strong recommendation that we should have a, a, a target uh, T level of less than 20? I think the first thing you have to think about is who is the, 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 the stage? What is the, the stage in the prostate cancer journey that you're, we're, we're, we're addressing? Is it uh, an adjuvant strategy? Is it a BCR population? Is it a um, metastatic de novo? Is it an uh, MCRPC population? Uh, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll probably talk more about too is how patients tolerate very, very low T suppression, where it's essentially, you know, uh, almost undetectable to less than three nanogram or less than four nanogram per deciliter versus 40 nanogram per deciliter. And I, I think it matters. And I bring it up because what is the stage of disease that you're, you're making this decision? And it's an incredibly important decision, especially if it's not for short-term indication. Uh, personally, if it's for someone with metastatic disease, the, the least controversial time to start testosterone suppression, I think that does make a difference. And I think it should be less than 20 nanogram per deciliter. You know, today, and, and exactly the reasons that Neil was was discussing, I'm I'm a little bit ambivalent to that because I'm so rarely using monotherapy ADT. Not all of them the drugs directly block T production. Some of them block, you know, T receptors, et cetera. Hey, I'm working to get the patients on the ideal combination of therapy now. Uh, so, you know, I, I won't say I'm truly ambivalent, but you know, I don't know that we have the full understanding of the relative importance to, you know, a T level of, of, of 18 versus 35 versus a patient who's on an additional therapy, an additional hormonally active therapy and not. And I think it's, it's important because, of course, if we're using ADT alone, I want this the lowest as possible. Without question, you know, end of story. And those other studies and those other treatments tell you exactly why. I mean, they're still working on the hormone axis to essentially get the lowest activity of testosterone, the androgen receptor, and, and all the downstream effects of that. Let's talk about some of the nuances, uh, challenges with uh, with uh, androgen deprivation therapy. That's relatively new that I... that. Uh, and, that's the cardiovascular stuff, the giving on time and and things like this. This was our paper that was published in 2020, about the same time that you did yours. And then and you actually mentioned this in your paper about um, late dosing of ADT. We all know that the pivotal studies were done on a 28-day month, not a 31-day month. And I don't think people understand that, and, I, and insurance companies certainly don't want to understand it. But what does it matter? So we, we love this. We have this very nice database, a real world study of twenty two thousand men, looking at it. Did they get it on time, or did they get it late after twenty eight days? And then what if we gave them a little vacation of four days? What would what would happen? And so what this is this is astonishing but what we see is 84% of the patients uh were late and uh, 84% were administered beyond that 28 days 
And so what, what's the, what's the impact? And people say, oh, so what? Well, the so what is if you did, if you gave it weight, what we see is um, about a third of the patients went above 20, but if you went really late uh, beyond that four days, you see that the number above 50 is over a quarter, a quarter of the people and half of the people have T levels that went up greater than uh, 20. So Ben, what, what, are, what are your sort of thoughts about this? 84% of the agents were administered and, and not on time. How do you, how do you feel about it? What do we do about it? Do we care about it? We should, we obviously should care about it and and should be doing everything we can to to fix it. But it also is working. You know, it's a, working against us, especially when you start talking about four and six months to get to hit that sweet spot. You know, right on or even within a week or two is is difficult. And and you're you know working with different people's schedules. It's a it's a challenge. So it is very important. How practical it is is the real difficulty here, Neil. Your comments? Yeah, I I completely agree with uh, Ben's comments. You know, there's just some real practical considerations. No, no matter how hard we try, you know, when you look at your your data, patients just get lost. They forget. Do they get called back? Uh, and so these escapes happen, especially if you've got metastatic disease, um, and you believe that T suppression matters. Um, and it should be done in a timely way, then it really does become extremely important. And then trying to figure out whether it's the one, three, six parenteral administration or a daily oral, you know, it, I don't know that we're ever going to say one is perfectly well suited. We have to pull together all the different aspects of the practice. You know, as I go back to you earlier, if it's just somebody receiving a short course for you know, intermediate risk disease uh, for a grade group three radiation patient, how important is that as opposed to someone with significant metastatic disease? I think it's it's pretty clear the latter is, is more concerning versus the former. I, I think it makes a big difference. And I think that it particularly so for patients with advanced disease. I mentioned that, uh, that ADT, and we all know this, is sort of the foundation we build on the backbone across all of these new agents and across disease state. And I, I think it's important to have a good foundation to build your build on. And that foundation is uh, castrate levels of testosterone and this brought about by uh, properly administered ADT. So Neil, this is from your paper. I, I, this talks about the variation and guidelines. Now, we don't have to go through all of these, but what's sort of the take-home message here? Well, I, I, I have to really applaud our European colleagues. I, I think that they have been uh, a, a little bit more um, uh, proactive. They've been more detailed, and they've uh, adapted quicker to the data that's out there. Uh, and you kind of see this in, in the EAU guidelines, and it, it's not just in in T suppression and the importance for the you know uh, um, monitoring, but in, but in a lot of other things as well throughout GU oncology. Uh, the other recommendations are all reasonable, but they haven't really taken as bold of a an approach as our as EAU has. This this is a great table within your paper. And I, I think it means that, hey, if you have ineffective suppression, uh, it's time to look elsewhere. It's your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, are you uh, are you mixing your drug correctly? Uh, is there delivery challenges, whether you, you know, how, whether you're giving it sub Q or IM? Uh, are there timeliness issues as, as, as your great, you know, uh, paper points out as your first author there? Uh, and, and even anything as, as, as basic as the simple nursing and administration uh, issue. So I think this is really important. Another good reason for checking T, because if you're, if you're looking at your checklist and it's not an administration issue, it's not a timeliness issue, it may be time for sure to consider uh, changing your your therapeutic. 
This is a this is an interesting question. I want to throw this uh, at you, Ben. I mean, it's this is the follow up with the with the Neil's last uh, figure of three. There is the concept of failure to monitoring T levels to, uh, leading to erroneous diagnosis of CRPC. So that means um, if the T is elevated above castrate with a rising PSA, how do you interpret that? For many of our colleagues that don't check testosterone regularly, you know, and I think that that question of how do you check it regularly is also relevant. I mean, I, unfortunately, with with my clinic, just practically, we're getting a lot of the blood work at the same time that we're giving the next injection on the same day. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we try to do it a week before, but, you know, we're not going to delay, as we've talked about already, we don't want to delay the treatment just to get the blood work if the patient hasn't had it already. So they often get it the same time they're in the office for their their injection. And so you're sometimes working, you know, you're you're working with uh, you've just given them a shot. Now they're you get their testosterone result back and it's a little bit high. But even if you're not proactively checking checking testosterone, when the PSA rises, I think that's when most of our colleagues, you know, hopefully agree that 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 testosterone is being checked. Um, and so certainly if you're diagnosing someone as CRPC, you want to at least meet that definition of less than 50. And, and I think that's both required if you're considering any additional treatments, but it, it's also just to make sure you're giving adequate therapy. Um, I do think this is an interesting point, though, to think about, okay, what do you do in a situation where someone is truly failing, either by PSA or, or even by imaging, and their, and their testosterone is, you know, in that 35 range? Yes, I would want to consider doing better with my ADT. But yes, I also want to get them on the more advanced therapies as quickly as possible if they're, you know, given that for many of them, um, there does appear to be better uh, outcomes if they're found earlier and gotten on therapy earlier. So I guess the answer to this question is it, it would be considered erroneous if it's greater than 50. I wouldn't consider it erroneous if it's less than 50 and above 20, but I would be simultaneously working to get the T down below 20 as I'm likely also adding on other therapies. Neil, what, what do you think? Yeah, that's the exact point I wanted to make. I mean, it, you know, we all love doing trials and you know, clinical trials is a standard of care uh, for all of our colleagues who, who, who are listening. And that said, you know, if you have somebody who's you know, 60, 75, um, you know, what, then what do you do? And the PSA is going up and they're on an antagonist, do you switch them to an agonist? Or if they're on an agonist, do you switch them to an antagonist? Or if they're on one agonist, do you switch them to a different agonist? Bilateral orchiectomy people do still. Let's or see. you do bilateral orchiectomy. You're absolutely right. For for trial purposes, you're 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 pretty much, you know, having to do that. Um, if you're in the clinic, I, you know, I I'll I'll think about all of those strategies. You're absolutely right, including even bilateral archaeectomy. It's a challenge. So I guess I guess uh, we we've sort of built up to this one. So there's six answers here. Uh, Neil, how would you and which what would you pick here? Like I said, I mean I always check a T at baseline before I initiate ADT. I mean it's an inexpensive test. You know if you're you're getting in, invariably you're getting a CBC and a CMP and an LDH and a metastatic patient as well as a PSA. Yeah, I get a T. Uh, when the patient comes back, depending upon the ADT that I choose, when I recheck their PSA, I always check a testosterone level because I'm kind of fascinated to see, you know, if they started off and they were 600 or 190, where's their T now? And if they're well suppressed, I don't typically recheck a T un until their PSA starts to, um, you know, if it's starting to go up. Um, and so that's been, I think, generally my pattern. So Ben, this, uh, this is, uh, uh, what's your answer? Just pick one. <laughs> uh, ideally one, um, but at least every three to six months checking a T while they're on therapy. What do you, we've already talked about this. If escapes occur, what should you do? And I think we heard that at least from your paper, you're suggesting switching to a different agent, right, Neil? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's perfectly reasonable. And you know, I have had, you know, um, enough. It's 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 not the majority for sure of patients, but it is a 
significant enough a minority. And I, I've had success going from one agonist to another, whether it was a, 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 a sub-Q to an IM or vice versa. And I've had success going from an agonist to an antagonist and vice versa, going antagonist to an agonist. You can't really always be absolutely sure why that was the case, but um, uh, I, I do think it's certainly a, a, you know, a tool that we should be aware of. And it all starts with at least checking a testosterone because if you make that switch and the PSA goes down, you're arguably buying the patient a little bit more time before right. you start a CRPC therapy. So uh, this is uh, your flow chart here. And um, I think we've already pretty much covered that. In an effective T suppression, uh, you've, you've very nicely gone through the things to go through your mind about injection sites and, and timing and so forth. And um, if those things uh, all seem to be okay, consider switching to another ADT. And I, I certainly have done that. I'm sure, Ben, you have too in your career. So I guess the, the other question is, are all ADT therapies equal in T suppression? And you had, a, you had your, your study uh, showed some delay with the, the, the sub-Q luproide, and, but there's a, really a dearth of studies. So uh, then is the belief that all LHRH agonists or antagonists show similar clinical uh, outcomes and um, the true uh, or um, rather than actually being evidence of, of there's no comparative trials. So what do you, what do you think uh, the answer to that question is? It, it's, a, it's an absence of evidence in any kind of structured way, right? I mean, it's, it's retrospective and, and attempts to make meta-analyses to show any difference, but, but we don't have those head-to-heads to really be able to say for sure. Um, so it's an absence of ev evidence, but I think there's, um certainly experience that you know tells people and, and leads people to to different conclusions so i i think i think that belief is is in some respect just because of the lack of evidence again doc, dr shore very nicely said that we want to get the t down less than 20 here um just uh we're all familiar with uh gnrh as a decapeptide and different changes in the amino acids result in different drugs. But the one that uh, is just on one amino acid on six is the one that Shally first developed was tryptorelin. And um, then we have, uh, we have uh, luprolide and we have uh, some of the other drugs down here. The, the point is uh, comparative trials uh, and we uh, acknowledge Verity, who uh, provided an educational grant for this discussion, and I did. I I, I do want to mention that they have a couple trials that are close to being uh, significant here. But you know, tryptorelin has been around for a long time, uh, more popular in Europe than it was in the U.S. Uh, and it it does uh, have some advantages, as you can see here: a longer half life, higher biologic potency, and things like that. Here's one of the early studies, a South African study done by Haynes. That was a study that was uh, published, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago, in the British Journal of Urology, and a relatively new one by Shim, uh, looking at uh, a group of uh, men who were treated with different uh, LHRH agonists and including the ones that we commonly use. Uh, and you, tryptorelin has a one, three and six month depot. And you can see here, it does achieve castrate levels and keeps them there. And, you know, I think this would be true when we look at, we compare most of the ones that are out there. But when you look at uh, testosterone suppression, it's a little bit slower with tryptorelin than it is with luprolide, but this is a, a comparison and this is a LIN trial. Um, but you see that at the end of the day with the one months, um, they, there was a, uh, some advantage here of uh, tryptorelin. And then um, the, the last thing I, I want to talk about here is that, that about maintaining T levels less than 10. So, We've been talking about less than 20, 
Uh, Neil, Ben, do you see any any advantage of being less than ten, or or we just don't know? Well, you know, it's it's so it's so interesting. You know, I remember, you know, we there was a, a point in time where we were using the word, you know, androgen um, access annihilation. Yeah. Especially when we started getting, uh, you know, when the when the AR um, a, a inhibitors came out, whether it was, uh, you know, flutamide, nalutamide, then bicalutamide, and then of course, you know, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, abiraterone, um, what we're now calling, you know, artas, um, and and you know, if you if you're a believer in the concept that you want that annihilation then you would want um, all of the ligands, all of the fuel sources, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, as well as any other sort of promiscuity, other ligands, whether it's a, a, um, something pushing on the, other than the AR to be stopped. Mm -hmm. So, and, and when recognizing that there's no cancer type that's more hormonally sensitive than prostate cancer, you certainly would say, well, I got somebody who's really got bad biology. I want that T as low as possible. But, you know, we still we still struggle because we see PSA declines, whether it's a, a level of, of T is 10 or 15 or 35. And we sometimes and we and we declare victory. Clearly, our couplet trials now and triplet trials in the MCSPC tell us that's not, uh, it's not enough to see the PSA go down and declare victory. There's, there's more at play and it's clearly involving the, you know, the androgen uh, 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 axis. Ben, I want you to help me with these conclusions here now. So the, the first one says the therapeutic goal of ADT is its foundational therapy to lower T in an orderly delayed time uh, in order to delay time incidence to progression to crpc prolonged survival um testosterone levels should be less than 20 and i ben, i guess i believe we, we've talked about that but you believe that right absolutely and and i think you know i guess part of my point is that crpc is a is a definition and we we have to deal with definitions um, but we should be optimizing every part of our therapy. And, and the goal of ADT is to get the testosterone as low as possible. So even, even getting it to less than 10 is fantastic. Of course, that that's great. And we believe it would be even better than less than 20. Um, so, so we always want to be shooting for the best possible and strongest possible response. We, we need to really define the castrate level with less than 20. And then, I, you know, the, the, uh, other thing is uh, when the, when the T rises uh, or the PSA goes up, you should get a get a T also. Um, you know when when you, this looking into the crystal ball, I mean this that they have your the firepower you two have uh, in knowledge of prostate cancer. I want to ask a couple of questions. So, you know, when you think about every cancer that we cure, it's not treatment A followed by treatment B followed by treatment C, it's combos. I don't know, Neil, you know the answer to this because uh, from recent studies, what percentage of newly diagnosed patients are actually put on a doublet, let alone a triplet? It's not very high. Well, we're making progress. You're absolutely right. And it depends upon the, the source that you're looking at. Um, and it depends on where you are in the country. If we're just looking at the U.S., I, we're getting closer. The most recent data that I've seen, we're getting closer across the entire country to um, about 50 percent of MCSPC, low volume, high volume patients getting uh, a doublet. But um, I think the answer should be really closer to 90 percent. Yeah. There may be about 10 percent of patients who would it would not be you know, unreasonable to just do monotherapy ADT. The data is overwhelming. There are now about eight different studies that support uh, not doing monotherapy for MCSPC patients. But, you know, we, uh, you know, it, you know, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, the guidelines have adopted the importance of, of, of doublet therapy. And in some, in, in some cases, situations, triplet therapy, and, you know, it's an ongoing educational need. 
And, and, you know, this program that you've organized here to, tonight, David, which is, I think is great, still makes our colleagues and all of us have to think about the importance of T suppression and, 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 and what value do you place on the level of T. And, and I think we're going to continue to learn more. There's a lot of couple of trials coming forward in addition to the MCSPC space that in the BCR arena, in neoadjuvant strategies. So I think there's a lot more to come and what the T was at, at baseline and what happened to it will continue to be, you know, debated, but it's still very important. Yeah. Do you think, uh, well, I, I think the other thing about uh, uh, getting T down as low as you can and keeping it there is that there may, you may progress uh, slower to CRPC. Now, you know, the question, are we going to, are we going to be seen in a few years doing say nine months of therapy and stopping it? I mean, not, not the intermittent stuff, hit it, hit it heavy hit it, and hard to begin with. Uh, like Neil said, the annihilation. Yes, we absolutely need to know how and when to intensify our therapies and earlier is better. But part of that goal should be is with the possibility at some point maybe to de-intensify. So yes, I would love to see more uh, structured studies where we're, you know, we're talking about six or nine months or even the two years, because there's certainly data out of Stampede and other trials that have come about two years of ADT therapy along with radiation for regional disease, et cetera, and, and, and even low volume uh, metastatic disease in some cases, and maybe being able to, to, to get off of ADT. I think that would be wonderful for patients, both from a symptomatic standpoint, and also to, to continue to have ADT as, a, as an option if they do progress. So let me ask uh, one final question here, or we can maybe, uh, you want to make some other comments, but what would you tell your best friend, Ben? What what would you tell him to, to do for, for treatment for his prostate cancer really quickly? I mean, for a patient that that is, can tolerate yeah. it, I think our right. best evidence is is triplet therapy. Um, and, and I would recommend, you know, kind of hit it hard early. Uh, certainly check for biomarkers, understand if he may be fortunate enough to have one that we know can generate a, a survival benefit. But up front, it would be triplet therapy with chemo, uh, ADT, and an oral agent. Neil? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I, I actually have been doing that prior to the results from PEACE-1 and Aracens. It never made sense to me to start someone with high volume disease on ADT dose ataxel based upon the great work from Charted and Stampede, and then just sit back and wait for them to develop CRPC. So I, I've actually been doing it for years. I was very happy to see uh, Piece One, at, which used Abby as, as the triplet, and Arisens, which used Darrow as the triplet oral. Um, you know, so if patient is chemo eligible, chemo tolerant, I hit him hard. Ben makes a great point. For those patients, that patient, your friend, high volume disease, you know what, I'm, I'm aggressive. I think your first shot uh, tends to be your best shot. Uh, and so I, I'm, I tend to be a lot more proactive. And if I, and if I can find somebody who has an, a biomarker, uh, I, I would try to think about incorporating that, of course. Putting them into a clinical trial is is the best thing that one can do. Any other uh, final comments from either one of you? I want, want to thank both of you very much. It's uh, rare to get the opportunity to get uh, two people together like we have tonight. Ben, parting remarks? No, I, I thank you very much, David, for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, I think the last line in here is also one we always have to remind people just because the ADT is not solely controlling it, they need to stay on um, for, for even as they fail. And I would say that's often when I kind of realized, geez, the patient wasn't as low on their T as, the, as I wanted, uh, you know, even now that they're not on anything else again, other than ADT. But um, this message of, of checking the testosterone and trying to get it as low as possible is, 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 is a foundational part of everything we do for advanced prostate cancer. Neil? I, I agree with all that. And uh, I, I just echo Ben and say, David, thank you. Thank you for the amazing leadership that you've uh, shown. This is just another uh, example of that, having programs to push the envelope of, of how we're practicing. So thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you both. And uh, 
again, um, thank Grand Rounds in Urology, everybody that's uh, been involved with uh, putting this together. Um, and uh, also Verity uh, for the educational grant to do this.